Namah Om Vishnu Padaya Krishna Kristaya Bhutali Shimati Bhakti Vedanta Swamini Tinamini Namaste Saraswati Devi Gurvani Pacharine Nirvisesa Sunyavadi Paskati Desatarine Jaya Sri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nichananda Sri Dvaita Gadadhar Srivasadi Gaur Bhakta Vindam <coughs> Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, <coughs> Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare. Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. <coughs> Hare Krishna. So today we're going to continue. <coughs> in our study of Srimad Bhagavatam and Bhagavad Gita. And I received homework from Shivani and Shritan and Augustya and also Shrestha. So I want to look at Shivani's first she says, uh, this is my homework. And she asks a question also. It says, uh, those who are less than a brahmana by qualification cannot establish any relationship with the Lord. Just as a fire cannot be kindled from the raw earth unless there is wood, although there is a relation between wood and the earth. And Srimani says, I don't think I explained the simile or the comparison between those who are less than Brahmana <coughs> cannot establish any relationship with the word, just as fire cannot be kindled from raw earth unless there is wood, although there is a relation between wood and the earth. And she said, I don't think I explained the simile very well. Please tell me where I went wrong and please help me understand the simile better. Thank you. Well, that's <coughs> a good question, a fair question. And... Uh, Let's see what she wrote, and then we'll try and answer that doubt that she has about understanding the simile. The first point is that whenever there's a simile, <coughs> the validity of the simile depends on the number of uh, number of points of similitude or similarity in the simile. So that's just a general uh, observation, and then we'll become specific about it. So here it says, her, sh her answer to the question is, Brahmana qualities are when someone is in the complete mode of goodness. This means that a person is truthful to others. They are equipoised. You said poised, but it's equipoised. They have control. They have controlled their senses. They are tolerant. They live a simple life. They're educated about general knowledge and they're educated about transcendental knowledge. And they have full faith in the Vedic wisdom. When one has these qualities, they're considered as a Brahmana. So when Prabhupada says, those who are less then a brahmana, by qualification, cannot establish any relationship with the Lord. Just as fire cannot be kindled from the raw earth unless there is wood, although there's a relation between wood and the earth. He means, now this is where her question is coming in, he means that when one doesn't have the qualities of a brahmana, they cannot build a relationship with Krishna. Prabhupada compares this with saying how fire 
cannot be made from earth unless there is wood. And there is a relation between wood and the earth. In other words, just like a fire cannot be made without wood, you cannot establish a relationship with Krishna without having the, without having the qualities of a brahmana. Now, your answer, Shivani, is correct. What Everything you wrote is correct. But let's go deeper into the comparison here between a brahmana, uh, uh, a person who has brahminical qualities, who is able to build up a relationship with Krishna, and a person who does, have, does not have brahminical qualities and who is not able to build up a relationship with Krishna. And compare that to um, building a fire from wood. Uh, building a fire from wood as compared to building a fire from earth. Although wood and earth are related. Well, let's go back to fundamentals first. What is earth? Earth is made up of... Earth, water, fire, air, and ether. All those things are present in the earth. It's not just one thing. It's all a combination of all five of those things. And what is a tree? A tree is a living entity. Uh, in the form of a seed. And when the seed becomes activated by water and heat, it begins to, it has a, a root, a uh, stem, and eventually leaves and flowers. Now the root uh, draws water with minerals and other things uh, into the stem and the stem uh, is the, uh, let's say, the conduit for feeding these minerals and water to the leaves. And eventually, uh, as the stem gets bigger, it becomes a trunk. And there are branches, and there are leaves, and then there's flowers, and then eventually fruits. And the stem and the branches, they become uh, what's called wood, which is built up of cellulose and, and other things. But basically, it's the transformation of the earth. And the earth is made of earth, water, fire, air, and, uh, and ether. Okay, so these transformations take place due to the presence of the soul, the individual soul of the tree. Without the transformations, you would just have earth, water, fire, air, and ether, or space. But because of the selective choice by the soul of different minerals and water and other th substances in the earth, it brings them together and forms uh, cellulose and other things, and it becomes a tree. So although there's a relationship between the earth and the wood, if you try and set fire to the raw earth, it won't set fire. It won't, it won't go anywhere. But if you set fire to wood, it will burn because the wood has inherent in it a whole bunch of energy or energies due to the combination the selective combination of the living entity and the tree. So, if you have just a person 
who has not undergone any transformation of Krishna consciousness, then they don't have the capacity to understand Krishna. Just like if you just take the raw earth and try and set it on fire, it will not burn. But if you take the transformation of the earth in the form of a tree, now the tree has a lot of things in it that are flammable, can be set on fire and release the energy that's been built up in the tree in the form of heat and light. Whereas that energy in the raw earth is in a potential state, but that energy in the wood is a potential is uh, a potential energy that can be released. Now there is energy in the earth also, but it's not easily flammable, whereas energy in the tree is easily flammable. In other words, in other words it can set, be set on fire and release the built-up energy in it. So previously we did study uh, what's called uh, uh, different types of energies. There's potential energy and so forth. I forget the exact names right now. We can go back and look at our previous homeworks from a year or so ago and uh, look at that again. So look, one second, let me see if I can find it now. So potential energy is okay. So there's potential energy and kinetic energy. So potential energy is the energy in a body due to its position, while kinetic energy is the energy in a body due to its motion. The formula for potential energy is mgh, where m stands for mass. G stands for gravitational acceleration, and H for height. Okay. And then uh, the uh, kinetic energy is due to its motion. Okay. So the tree has a lot of potential energy due to its mass and uh, its potential for gravitational acceleration and its height. So the green tote grows out of the earth. It can go up very high. So all that is potential energy. If a tree falls down, it releases a lot of energy. If the tree burns, it releases a lot of energy. But the tree is stationary. Now, unless you cut it down, it doesn't move. But if you do cut it down, then it, it manifests kinet kinetic energy also. All right, so... Um, the brahmana is endowed with brahminical qualities. Samadhamma tapak sojana santir arjavam evicha jnanam vijnanam sahitam brahma karma svabhavajam. So these are some of the qualities explained in the 18th chapter of the brahmana. Sama, equilibrium of the mind. Dhamma, self-control. Tapa, austerity. Sojam, cleanliness. Samatamak tapak socham shantir, tolerance and forgiveness. Shantir arjimam, honesty and simplicity. Jnanam, theoretical knowledge, and agyanam, uh, and vigyanam, uh, is practical, realized knowledge. So these are all, these are some of the qualities of a brahmana. 
So a person that doesn't have those qualities, although they're a person, although they have the potential for developing those uh, qualities, but they don't have it. So they cannot understand Krishna. But someone who's developed these qualities uh, of a brahmana, they have a better chance of understanding Krishna. To understand Krishna, you have to come up to his level. And his level is, he is uttama, above all ignorance and above the influence of the modes of material nature. So, uh, to ha so I hope this will help the Shivani understand better the simile of the Brahmana as opposed to an ordinary person who can understand Krishna and uh, the simile of uh, fire and earth and wood. Wood, uh, wood is related to the earth. It's made from the earth, but it's developed a lot of mass, more, more let's say, concentrated mass and height, and uh, therefore its potential for releasing energy is much greater than simply earth. Therefore, it's, it's, its ability to, let's say, the brahmana's ability to understand Krishna is much greater than the ordinary person who does not have brahminical qualities. So the earth's ability to be set on fire is much less than wood, which is related to earth, uh, because the wood has built up its potential and kinetic, potential kinetic energy by growing out of the earth, but it's basically made out of earth, but it's, it's made by a soul who selectively chooses earth, water, fire, and ether, puts them together, and also collects energy from the sun, and all that makes it much more potent uh, to release energy when the right conditions happen. Okay, so... Next, we have homework by Augustia. Let's see what Augustia says. Elaborate on the six opulence of the Lord as explained in the purport of Shimad Bhagavatam 1.14.34. Provide examples of when the opulences are exhibited by the Lord. To understand the question, let's figure out what the six opulences of the Lord are. And Srimad Bhagavatam 114.34 explains that the six opulences are all power, all knowledge, all wealth, all beauty, all fame, and all renunciation. Everyone possesses a fraction of the opulences in varying amounts, but only Krishna fully possesses them all. In his lecture on Bhagavad Gita, 13 verse uh, chapter 13, verse 19, Srila Prabhupada states that when one fully possesses all six opulences, he is God. Oh, I guess you would have to say all six opulences in full, not just possesses, because every living entity possesses up to these same six uh, opulences, but much, in much less quantity than Krishna. So it's not only opulence possesses but must have possessed them in full. That's one correction you can make, Augusta. Everyone possesses a fraction of the opulences in varying amounts, but only Krishna fully possesses them in all. Correct. In his lecture on Bhagavad Gita, Srila Prabhupada states that when one fully possesses all six opulences, he is God. Correct. He explains that many people are trying to become God by fully acquiring the six opulences through karma, jnana, and yoga. But that is not possible. That statement has been analyzed by a plethora or by many saintly persons, including Lord Brahma, who gives his decree, no, his, I would say his opinion. Uh, okay, let's look up this word, D-E-C-R-E-E, -E -E, a decree. 
Uh, maybe you could say decree. Decree is some kind of formal declaration, including Lord Brahma, who gives his decree in the Brahma Samhita. Let, let me look that word up. Okay, we'll look it up in a minute. An example who gives his decree in the Brahma Samhita. An example of when Krishna uses all power is when he lifts Govardhan Hill on his pinky. As explained in Bhagavad Gita, Krishna possesses all knowledge because he gives us the king of all knowledge, devotional service. Since everything is part and parcel of Krishna, Krishna possesses all wealth. Okay, so that's Augustus' explanation of elaborating on the six opulences of the Lord. Okay. So, two. Explain what Prabhupada means by, therefore, we need his protection for his own interest. In the purport of Srimad Bhagavatam 114.34. And he says, those who serve the Lord sincerely derive real happiness from their spiritual senses, unlike those who have turned their back on Krishna and are trying to enjoy separate from him. Therefore, we need Krishna's protection to be able to have a chance to serve him and experience real happiness. Mm. Well, okay, if we look at the phrase that we're talking about, which is, Prabhupada says, therefore we need his protection for his own interest. Okay, so the first his is capitalized in that sentence, and the second his is not capitalized. So what does that mean? That means the first his is referring to Krishna, and the second his is referring to the living entity. Now, if we understand that, then the, the correct explanation of that sentence is, therefore we need, we meaning living entities, need his, capital H, Krishna's protection for his, for, uh, well, okay, so it would be, we need his protection for our own interest. That would be the real reading of that sentence. The confusion is the second his, which is a small h, uh, if I'm not, if I'm correctly understanding this, we need his protection. It should have been for our own interest. In other words, to achieve our goal of being liberated from the influence of time, the modes of material nature, and all negative things like lust, anger, greed, and so forth. We need Krishna's protection while we're doing devotional service so we can actually get to the goal of being liberated from these negative things so that we actually engage in pure devotional service. So what's, what throws you off here is the second his, uh, which is not capitalized. It should actually be, at least in my estimation, therefore we need his protection for our own interest. Well, that's when our own interest means our desire to become Krishna conscious. So then in the explanation, he says, those who serve the Lord sincerely derive real happiness from their spiritual senses unlike those who have turned their back on Krishna and are trying to enjoy separate from him. Therefore, we need Krishna's protection to be able to have a chance to serve him and experience real happiness. Well, let's look at other things Krishna says to try and understand this better. Uh, let's see. In the Bhagavad Gita.
it says fifth chapter Durgatim. One second. No, it's not the fifth chapter. Let me just look this up. Nahikayanakrit. Nahi. Hmm. That's interesting. Okay, it's not there. So, uh, let's see, maybe it's the sixth chapter then. Hmm. Well, anyway, that verse says, one who does good is never overcome by evil. Yeah, sixth chapter, 40th verse. The Supreme Personality of Godhead said, O son of Preeta, a transcendentalist engaged in auspicious activities does not meet with destruction either in this world or in the, or in the spiritual world. One who does good, my friend, is never overcome by evil. So, in this in a purport, it says, even though a devotee may be subjected to the reaction for not perfectly executing prescribed duties, he is still not a loser because auspicious Krishna consciousness is never forgotten and one so engaged will continue to be so even if he is lowborn in the next life. On the other hand, one who simply follows strictly the prescribed duties need not necessarily attain auspicious results if he is lacking in Krishna consciousness. The purport may be understood as follows. Humanity may be divided into two sections, namely the regulated and the non-regulated. Those who are engaged simply in bestial sense gratifications without knowledge of their next life or spiritual sal salvation belong to the non-regulated section. And those who follow the principles of prescribed duties in the scriptures are classified amongst the regulated section. The non-regulated section, both civilized and non-civilized, educated and non-educated, strong and weak, are full of animal propensities. Their activities are never auspicious because while enjoying the animal propensities of eating, sleeping, defending, and mating, they perpetually remain in material existence which is always miserable. On the other hand, those who are regulated by scriptural injunctions and who thus rise gradually to Krishna consciousness certainly progress in life. Okay, so now this next part is, is the one that is very important. It says, those who are following the path of auspiciousness can be divided into three sections, namely the followers of scriptural rules and regulations, who are enjoying material prosperity. Two, those who are trying to find ultimate liberation from material existence. And three, those who are devotees in Krishna consciousness. Those who are following the rules and regulations of the scriptures for material happiness may be further divided into two classes. Those who are fruit of workers and those who desire no fruit for sense gratification. Those who are after fruit of results for sense gratification may be elevated to a higher standard of life, even to the higher planets, 
but still, because they are not free from material existence, they are not following the truly auspicious path. The only auspicious activities are those which lead one to liberation. Any activity which is not aimed at ultimate self-realizations or liberation from the material bodily concept of life is not at all auspicious. Activity in Krishna consciousness is the only bodily is is the only auspicious activity and anyone who voluntarily accepts all bodily discomforts for the sake of making progress on the path of Krishna consciousness can be called a perfect transcendentalist under severe austerity. And because the Eightfold Yoga system is directed toward the ultimate realization of Krishna consciousness, such practice is also auspicious and no one who is trying his best in this manner in this matter, need fear of degradation. So basically what he's saying here in, in a very, uh, let's say, somewhat complicated way is that even if you're unsuccessful in Krishna consciousness in this life, by the protection of Krishna, at least you'll take birth in as a human being and either in a family of pure devotees or in a, 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 that's if you practice Krishna consciousness for a long time, or in a family of rich aristocracy if you did not practice Krishna consciousness for a long time. But either way, you're given a chance in the human form of life to continue devotional service in the next life. Okay. So when it says that we need Krishna's protection to be able to have a chance to serve him and experience real happiness. Well, yes, Krishna promises to protect his devotee. Now, his devotee is not simply a brahmana. Although Brahmanal, Brahm, Brahminical qualifications are necessary to understand Krishna, but his devotee is someone who's actually developed affection and love for Krishna and, are, and is working specifically for the comfort of Krishna. Just like the Pujari is working for the comfort of Krishna by bathing Krishna, waking him up, chanting for him, uh, putting on uh, putting on clean clothes or uh, new clothing for him and he's doing all these things he or she is doing all these things for the Krishna's personal comfort and that is and that's practice for going back to Godhead because that's what the gopis are doing in the spiritual world so a person who attains the possibility to engage in uh, pure devotional service for Krishna has nothing to fear because Krishna will protect that devotee. That devotee is under the protection of Krishna because of the affection and love that the devotee is, ex uh, is experiencing in serving the Lord. So, but a simple brahmana who is not necessarily a devotee and there are many people like that. They are not uh, strictly under the protection of the Lord. They still have hankerings and desires for material happiness. Therefore, um, their activities look auspicious, but in reality, they're not so auspicious because they still have these hankerings. As long as a person is, is desiring material things, they are not actually a pure devotee. It's only when one gives up all those desires and only desires to please Krishna by their actions that they actually become a pure devotee. Okay, so let's take a look. So then Augustia, let's see, it's just Augustia somewhere. It says, therefore we need Krishna's protection 
to be able to have a chance to serve him and experience real happiness. You know, once you begin to serve the Lord sincerely, then the Lord protects you. You may not be an absolute pure devotee, but because your desire is to please the Lord, because you have some feelings for the Lord that you express through your preparation of prasadam, your chanting of the holy name, you're going out on sankirtan, and so forth, then the Lord protects you. Therefore, it says in Bhagavad Gita, in that chapter, what is it, 13th or 14th verse, Mahatmanas tu mam partha daivim pakritim asritaha bhajanti ananyamana so gyadva bhutadim avayam. O son of Prita, those who are not deluded, the great souls, are under the protection of the divine nature. They are fully engaged in devotional service because they know me as the Supreme Personality of Godhead, original and inexhaust inexhaustible. So that is 9th chapter, 13th verse. In this verse, a description of the Mahatma is clearly given. The first sign of the Mahatma is that he is already situated in the divine nature. He is not under the control of material nature. And how is this affected? That is explained in the seventh chapter. One who surrenders unto the Supreme Personality of Godhead, Sri Krishna, at once becomes freed from the control of material nature. That is the qualification. So in other words, when you say, Dear Krishna, I have no other desire than to please you, my dear Lord. Please protect me so I can continue my devotional service. So that is the only thing that the devotee asks from the Lord. That is, please protect me so I can continue your devotional service. I have no other desire in this life. So when the devotee says that, they come under the protection of Krishna. And, and then in this purport, 9.13, it continues. One can become free from the control of material nature as soon as he surrenders his soul to the Supreme Personality of Godhead. That is the preliminary formula. Being marginal potency, as soon as the living entity is freed from the control of material nature, he is put under the guidance of the spiritual nature. The guidance of the spiritual nature is called Daivi Prakriti, divine nature. So when we so when one is promoted in that way by surrendering to the Supreme Personality of Godhead, one attains to the stage of a great soul or Mahatma. The Mahatma does not divert his attention to anything outside Krishna because he knows perfectly well that Krishna is the original supreme person the cause of all causes. There is no doubt about it. Such a Mahatma or great soul develops through association with other Mahatmas or pure devotees. Pure devotees are not even attracted by Krishna's other features, such as the four-armed Mahavishnu. They are simply attracted by the two-armed form of Krishna. They are not attracted by other features of Krishna, nor are they concerned with any form of a demigod or of a human being. They meditate only upon Krishna and Krishna consciousness. They are always engaged in the unswerving service of the Lord in Krishna consciousness. So this is a description of pure devotees. This is a description of someone who is under the protection of Krishna because they may not be absolutely perfect, but, it, but they say, my dear Lord, I have no other desire in life than to please you and my only request is protect me so I can continue my devotional service. If this person says that and means it, then Krishna, they come directly under the protection of Krishna. Okay. So next question. Explain what Srila Prabhupada means by a society devoid of cow protection and Brahminical culture. And such a society is not under the direct protection of the Lord. Just as the prisoners in the jail are not under the protection of the king, but under the protection of a severe agent of the king. In the purport, Augustia says, it says that without cow protection and civilization of, of the Brahminical qualities in human society, 
at least for a section of the members of society, no human civilization can prosper at any length, since something can only prosper with the blessing of the Lord. We can infer why Prabhupada is saying the first phrase. He also compares this to prisoners in a jail that are under the protection of a severe agent of the king, not the king himself. Okay, what is he talking about here? He's talking about if we're not protected by Krishna because our interest, because we have too many material desires to satisfy, therefore we're not consecrating all our time to uh, pleasing Krishna by our actions. Then we come under the uh, superintendence of of Durga, who is the uh, the superintendent of the material world. She's, she's the she's the warden of the jail, and the jail is the material body, which is influenced by the modes of material nature in the, in this material world. So, uh, either we come under the protection of Krishna, or we come under the control of Durga Devi. Now, Durga, who is the warden of the prison house of the material world, uh, what is her purpose? Well, she will often uh, give people material opulence, but then she takes it away from them also, just like we see how the stock market goes up and it comes down. So when it goes up, uh, people make money. And when it comes down, people lose money. When it goes up, people become happy because they think they have so much money. And when it goes down, people become sad because they lose a lot of money. So that is, the f that is Durga functioning. Just like America was doing great, the economy was going great, and then this pandemic comes, and in a, in a few months, that whole great uh, future seems to have uh, disappeared, and now people are struggling. And also, there's rioting, there's burning, there's... Uh, uh, violence, and so forth. So it goes, in, it goes up and down in the material world. That is Durga's action. She'll give and she'll take back. And as she takes back, people go crazy and they become very frustrated and angry. So this is... Uh, now, if you don't understand the background of uh, the material nature, uh, you become bewildered by this up-down uh, stock market up, stock market down, uh, society and 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 uh, material economic development up, and then society and material development down. We don't understand why it's happening. It's happening because this is the action of Durga. This is the way she teaches people that you don't actually belong in a material world. It's just like a fish out of water cannot exist and. And human beings without Krishna consciousness cannot exist happily. It's not possible. There's always going to be this up, down, uh, let's say, roller coaster of good fortune and bad fortune. In fact, it's a law of nature. Just like the law of gravity, another law of nature is that if you become a, uh, attached to material sense gratification, uh, you will be frustrated because... Material suffering always accompanies material sense gratification because they're illicit act it's an illicit activity. The senses the body belongs to Krishna. They should only be used for Krishna's they should only be used for Krishna's service. Sex is something that should only be used for procreation of children and then husband and wife take the responsibility to raise the children in Krishna consciousness. If they use sex only for pleasure, they're going to suffer. And we're seeing that. Uh, 
the Me Too hashtag, and so many so-called powerful uh, men and women who exploit others for sex are being shamed publicly. They're being prosecuted uh, for years and years of abuse. <laughs> so, nobody gets away with anything in the material world. Uh, the supreme arbiter of justice is Krishna himself, who's present in the heart of every living entity. So no one can do anything without it being witnessed by the Lord, and therefore the law of karma, which is created by Krishna, uh, rewards and punishes people on a regular basis. People who are so blind, blinded by lust, anger, greed, envy, illusion, and insanity, don't understand these things. Therefore, they're like uh, a ping pong ball or a ship without a rudder that's being battered back and forth on, by the waves of the ocean or a ping pong ball that's being uh, smacked back and forth over a, a table. Uh, they they are always uh, having periods of, oh, everything's going all right, and then other periods, oh, nothing is going all right. <coughs> so, in this verse, 913 Bhagavad Gita, it says, the Mahatma does not divert his attention to anything outside Krishna because he knows perfectly well that Krishna is the original supreme person, the cause of all causes. There is no doubt about it. Such a Mahatma or great soul develops through association with other Mahatmas or pure devotees. Pure devotees are not even attracted by Krishna's other features such as the four-armed Mahavishnu. They are simply attracted by the two-armed form of Krishna. They are not attracted to other features of Krishna, nor are they concerned with any form of a demigod or of a human being. They meditate only upon Krishna and Krishna consciousness they are always engaged in the unswerving service of the Lord in Krishna consciousness. So that means they're always protected by the mercy of the Lord. And people who are diverted in their concentration and uh, who may even be envious of Krishna, all they do is go up and down in the material world like the Ferris wheel. When the Ferris wheel, when you're sitting on the Ferris wheel and it's at and you're, you're at the top point, you feel happy. And then it comes down to the bottom point, and you're not so happy. So that's material life, up and down, and never completely steady. Never, there's no such thing as sustained happiness in the material world. It's always punctuated by misery. So misery, suffering, is to indicate to us that we've done something wrong. It's a message from Krishna or Krishna's agent Maya that we're doing things wrong. Now we, we say, well, I don't understand what I'm doing wrong. Okay, that's a fair question. But you must then search out people who can explain to you what you're doing wrong. What is wrong is meat eating, gambling and speculation, illicit sex, and intoxication. Those are the four pillars of wrong life, of wrong activities. But those four pillars are considered the source of happiness for materialists, you see. So this is how dangerous modern society is. The whole society, its educational system, its preoccupations is going in a wrong direction. Instead of protecting cows, they kill cows and eat them. Instead of, of uh, uh, practicing Brahminical culture, and everyone can practice Brahminical culture. You don't have to be born a Brahmin. Brahminical culture means, as we explained, samadhamak tapaksu chanam shantir arjava mevicha jnanam vijnanam sahitam yaj brahmakarma swabhavajan. Equilibrium of the mind, self control, samadhamak tapa, uh, austerity and uh, socham, cleanliness of the body, cleanliness of the mind, senses, and theoretical knowledge and practical, realized knowledge. These are some of the qualities of a brahmana. And when one 
develops these qualities. It doesn't matter what family you're born in, what your social position is. It doesn't even matter what, whether you can read or write. It just matters on who you associate with. So if you associate with genuine devotees, you can develop these Brahminical qualities and then be promoted from there, from that platform of Brahminical uh, qualities to actual Krishna consciousness. Where one is no longer interested in ritual performances for, for personal uh, aggrandizement or like for uh, material benefits, but you engage in Haram Sankirtan, Prashadam, hearing regularly Bhagavad Gita, Srimad Bhagavatam, which is all about Krishna, and uh, doing good to others. Nahi Kalyanakrit. Uh, uh as in sixth chapter and fortieth verse. Let's see if it, uh, yeah, Durgatim Tatagatshati. One who does good, O Arjuna, is never overcome by evil. So what is good? Good is Four things we should avoid, four things we should do. That's good. We should avoid meat eating, gambling, and speculation, illicit sex, and intoxication. And we should regularly, every day, chant the holy mantra, Maha Mantra Hare Krishna. We should every day listen to Bhagavad Gita as we are now and Srimad Bhagavatam. And we should eat only prasadam, food offered with love and devotion to Krishna. And we should regularly come to the temple, have the association of devotees, offer service to Krishna, and hear about Krishna and these other things. So the temple is a place where dadati pratigrinanti guyam akyanti puchati bhukte bhukte bhujayate jaiva sadvida pratilakshanam. It's a place where pratilakshanam Ex uh, exchanging the six types of loving uh, 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 relationships. Giving and receiving gifts. Giving and receiving prasadam. And giving and receiving endearing thoughts about Krishna. That's, that's called priti lakshanam. Six types of loving relationship. And the temple is a place for exchanging those, type, those six types of loving relationships or engaging in those types of relationships. So one who does good, nahi kalyana kutkasya, durgatim tatagatshati, is never overcome by evil. Why? Because by becoming a devotee of Krishna and engaging only in acts of goodness without any selfish motive other than to please Krishna, uh, one is, comes under the protection of the Lord. And as long as one has any hankerings, any material desires, even though they might do good things, but those good things are not genuinely good, therefore they're not protected by the Lord, and, they, and therefore they become controlled by Durga Mata, who, as we said, is the superintendent or the warden of the prison of the material world, so she rewards people with material opulence and then she takes it away and drives people crazy and, dis and disgusted. Okay, so, <clears throat> so we, did it, we discussed uh, verse 9, uh, 640 and then verse 913 uh, to answer uh, Augustus' questions. Let's go back here. And the final homework Augusta offered. Uh, it's a whole bunch of questions. Uh, okay, so explain the difference between Brahminical perfection and being a pure devotee of the Lord. Being a pure devotee of the Lord, you are free from all material desires and are actually already liberated. They are in a state of Brahma Bhuta, such a state when they don't think of anything other than Krishna, 
desire and lamentation don't affect them. And they are fully engaged in service. Thereby, being full in himself, he sees a stone and gold with an equal eye. Uh, so uh, Augusta writes, I'm not sure about this. No, it is correct, Augusta. That's called, there are two things that are more advanced than simply developing brahminical qualities. Simply uh, developing brahminical qualities, you become free of lamentation and heart hankering. But to go further, to advance further, you develop equal, uh, equality and neutrality. What does that mean? Equality means you actually see, first intellectually and then practically, that Krishna is in the heart of every living entity. That's called equality. You see that the Supreme Lord is present in the heart as the super soul or paramatma of every living entity, not only human beings, but every living entity, including ants and trees and birds and reptiles and insects and so forth. And, and therefore, uh, you respect the presence of Krishna in the heart of every living entity. That, that destroys, right away, prejudice, racism, all the isms communism, socialism, capitalism, because you see the divine nature of every living entity and their eternal relationship with Krishna, who's present in their heart, waiting to guide them. Because Krishna says, Sarva shichaham hridi sani visto, matak smitir gyanam apahanam cha, vedais cha sarvirham eva vedya, vedanta krit veda ved eva chaham, 15th chapter, 15th verse of the uh, Bhagavad Gita, Krishna says, I am in the heart of every living entity, and from me comes knowledge, remembrance, and forgetfulness. I am the, uh, and I am to be known through the Vedas, through all the Vedas. In other words, he's the supreme goal of all Vedic knowledge, and I'm the compiler of the Vedas, and I know the Vedas. So that's a very important verse in Bhagavad Gita 1515. Uh, so, that uh, this equilibrium or this equality is to see this supreme sarva sicham hridi sani vista that Krishna is present in the heart of everyone as the paramatma. He is the source of knowledge, remembrance, and forgetfulness. So if we want to come closer to Krishna, he says, te sam satita yuktanam bhajatam pritipurvakam dadami buddhiyogam tam yenamam upayantite. He's dwelling in the heart of everyone, and from him, he's the ultimate source of knowledge. So he gives us the knowledge by which we can come closer to him. Only because we're engaged, if we are engaged in devotional service, and our only desire is to please the Lord, then he gives us all knowledge. So therefore, spiritual knowledge is revealed. It's not academic. Academic knowledge uh, is artificial because it does not liberate us from the cycle of birth and death. In fact, academic knowledge keeps us in the cycle of birth and death. But revealed knowledge from Krishna liberates us from the cycle of birth and death and from the unnecessary force of, of birth and rebirth and so forth. Uh, we become free of that, of that whole cycle. So, okay, then Augustia writes in his homework, the difference between a brahmana and a devotee is the, uh, the difference is that a pure devotee always thinks of serving Krishna no matter how many circumstances prevent him from doing so. Unlike some people who have achieved brahminical perfection, but only think of getting liberated. Okay, so liberation is also a material desire. Uh, therefore, Lord Chaitanya says, na danam, na janam, na sundarim, kavitam va jagadise kamaye, mama janmani janmani sware, bhavatad bhakti rahaitukitwai. He says, oh, oh, Almighty Lord, 
I have no desire to accumulate with, uh, wealth, nor do I desire beautiful women, nor do I want any number of followers. I only want your causeless devotional service birth after birth. So, when it says I, I don't want any, uh, any followers, that means they, they don't want to be some big guru with thousands of disciples uh, or a, a father with uh, uh, ten sons. You know, uh, they're only interested, and they don't want uh, beautiful women, meaning uh, beautiful men or beautiful women. They're not interested in sense gratification or exploiting other people for sense gratification. They don't want any amount of wealth. Uh, no, they, any extra wealth they donate to spread Krishna consciousness, and they live a simple life, simple living, high thinking. And they don't want liberation. Mama Janmani Janmani Shwari, they simply want to uh, continue in devotional service birth after birth. They're not even asking for liberation. Liberation is also a material desire. They're already liberated. Real liberation is wherever you are, in the material world, in the heavenly planets, in the middle planets, or in hell, the lower planets. As long as you're engaged always in Krishna's service, you're liberated. Okay, so then uh, that's the difference between a regular brahmana and a pure devotee. So another question, number six. Explain what the simile means in the following quote. Those who are less than a brahmana by qualification cannot establish any relation with the Lord, just as fire cannot be kindled from the raw earth unless there is wood, although there is a relation between wood and the earth. Srila Prabhupada is trying to explain that if you are less qualified than a brahmana, no matter how hard you strive, you cannot establish a relation with the Lord. Just like if there is no word, and there, there, if there is no wood, the fire cannot burn just with the earth. Although there could be a relation, there is a relation between wood and the earth. If you are not a brahmana, you cannot establish a relation with the Lord. Although you may have connection with the Lord, so this doesn't mean. You have to be born in the Brahmana family to be a Brahmana. Anyone can be, develop Brahminical qualities, just like anyone has the po potential to become President of the United States or a doctor or a lawyer or whatever because uh, no one is obstructed. If they're willing to be educated, they can get the qualification of a doctor or a qualification of a politician or a qualification of an engineer, etc. So in the same way, if you're willing to be educated by genuine brahmanas, you can become a brahmana by education, by practice, and by uh, especially association. Anyway, we answered this question already when we read Shivani's homework. Then seven, explain why Yudhisthira Maharaj did not inquire about the well-being of Lord Krishna, but instead asked about the well-being of the residents of Dwarka. And Augustia's answer, Yudhisthira knew that since Krishna is all perfect in himself, there was no need to inquire of his welfare. But he also knew that Krishna only stayed where pious people reside, so he was interested to know about the pious deeds of the residents of Dwarka, or the pious deeds the residents of Dwarka performed to attract the interest of the Lord himself. Very good, Augustia, you did your homework. Good. And uh, we read Srivani, we read Augustus' homework, and there's Sritan, and there's Shrestha. But we're not going to read those now. I'm going to give you your homework for tomorrow. Your homework for tomorrow is Canto 2, Chapter 9, Verse 34, the Bhagavatam. And this is an extremely important verse. It's one of the nutshell, four nutshell verses of the Srimad Bhagavatam. We've already gone over this once before. But now we're going to go deeper into this verse, and especially the purport. Now, first of all, about the verse. The verse says, O Brahma, whatever appears to be of any value, if it is without relation to me, has no reality. Know it as my illusory energy, that re reflection which appears to be in darkness. Now, this is an extremely important verse, especially if you're a young person like all of you are. Uh, this verse can save you from mountains uh, and valleys of trouble. Why? Because it clearly says, 
whatever appears to be valuable, if it is without relation to Krishna, has no reality. Know it as my illusory energy. That, ref that reflection which appears to be in darkness. Okay. So to explain this, you, you have to read the purport carefully, especially the first two, three paragraphs. Uh, well, read the whole purport, but uh, the first three, three, four paragraphs are very important for answering the question. And what is the question? That is, understand the difference between uh, a real thing and an illusory understanding of it. Now, the example is a rope and a snake. If you see a rope in the dark and thick think it is a snake, then although the rope exists, your understanding of it is illusory. So the rope is a fact, but your understanding is an illusion by mistaking the rope for a snake. Or if you see a snake and mistake it for a rope, again, the snake is, is fact, but your understanding of it is an illusion. So an illusion is something that was never true. It's never true that the rope is a snake or that the snake is a rope. Both things have never been true. So that's another definition of an illusion. Or an illusion is to accept something to be some, something else uh, that's not related to it. So if you accept a rope to be a snake in the dark, then that causes you to act in a strange way. You become afraid of what you think is a, is a snake, although there's no snake there. But there is a rope. So the rope is a fact, but your understanding of the rope is an illusion. If you understand this simple but profound example, then you can begin to understand what Krishna is saying here. He said, he's speaking to Lord Brahma. He says, oh Brahma, whatever appears to be of any value, if it is without relation to me, has no reality. Now, how do we... How do we use this verse in our practical life? Well, let's say you're going to school and they're teaching you in school that there's no God. Everything happened by evolution. Darwin's theory of, uh, of evolution of species. And in the beginning, there was a Big Bang. And from the Big Bang, due to the law of gravity and other material principles, uh, one cell living entities appeared, and then the one cell living entities became two cell living entities, and two cell living entities became four cell living entities, and eventually you had human beings, and through survival of the fittest, genetic mutation, and over a very long period of time, of which there should be a fossil record, there you go. That's a mechanical explanation of creation and the existence of the material world. Okay, this is a theory. It's therefore they say Darwin's theory of ev evolution of species. They say the theory of the Big Bang as the origin of creation, or the theory that of atomic structure of the universe. So now we've studied this before, but I want you to. to also, uh, okay, first homework is to understand correctly the rope and snake uh, example of explaining what is an illusion. So explain that. And, the, and you can read the purport of, of verse 2, 934, where it is explained. Then secondly... Explain how you can use practically in your life on a daily basis the verse, Canto 2, Chapter 9, Verse 34, and give examples. I 
just gave an example of the Big Bang, Darwin's theory of evolution, and uh, also uh, there is no God. Uh, we can only get si knowledge through science, reason, and logic. Is that true? <laughs> so, uh, yeah, it, it, it may be true you can know how to uh, make computers and bridges and airplanes, but none of those things solve the real issue of life, which is birth, old age, disease, and death. Although sometimes they claim they can through science, reason, and logic, but everyone who makes that claim always dies before they solve the problem which is very interesting. So, uh, okay, so this second homework is how you use this verse practically every day in your life to determine what is real and what is false. What is an illusion, although it may be based on a fact. You see, that's, that's the whole point. Like if I say the rope is a snake, the rope actually exists, it's a fact, but my interpretation of it is wrong, and it's an illusion. <clears throat> or if I say, ah, the snake is a rope, again, the snake is a fact, but my interpretation of it is wrong, and therefore it's an illusion. So they say, Big Bang, oh, Big Bang may be a fact, there are Big Bangs all the time. We saw a Big Bang in, the, in Beirut three days ago. Did it create something? No, it destroyed a lot of things and people and injured a lot of people. Killed over, over 100 people, injured 5,000 people, ruined, made 300,000 people homeless in a matter of a minute, less than a minute. So does the ba Big Bang, as we saw in Beirut, create something or destroy something? So how could a Big Bang in the beginning of creation creates something, you see. When other big bangs like atomic bombs and uh, the Beirut uh, explosion of tons and tons of uh, ammonium nitrate and so forth, how can that create something, you see. So it's all these things are nonsense, they don't make sense. But there are big bangs, there are ropes, there are snakes, there, there is the atomic theory there is this thing, this theory, that theory, but the interpretation of it may be an illusion, although the thing itself may be a fact. So to learn the difference between fact and illusion is very important. And this verse clearly says, whatever appears to be of value, whatever thing that seems to be a, a valid fact, if it is without relation to me, Krishna says, has no reality. It's, a, it's an illusion. Know it as my illusory energy. Just like I've given this example before, I did meet one person once, a young man, and I asked him what he wanted to do in life. He said, I want to be a Microsoft employee. Oh, I said, great, what are you doing to become a Microsoft employee? He said, I'm smoking marijuana. I said, what? He said, I'm smoking marijuana. I said, how will that lead you to be a Microsoft employee. Well, at least 75 to 80 percent of Microsoft employees smoke marijuana. Huh, I said, interesting. I said, but what's your guarantee that if you smoke marijuana, you'll become an employee of Microsoft? So, well, I got an 80 percent chance. I said, that's not true. I said, first of all, I don't think it's true that 80 percent of the employees of Microsoft smoke marijuana. Secondly, there's no guarantee that if you keep smoking marijuana that you'll become an employee of Microsoft. But you see, this is an illusory concept that he's got in his mind. Although Microsoft exists, although employees that smoke mi marijuana exist, but that doesn't mean that that's the criterion by which you can get a job in Microsoft. So you see, uh, there are illusory concepts all over in this age of uh, hypocrisy and quarrel, this Kali Yuga, and people accept them as true. 
although they're false interpretations. <coughs> and what happens if you follow a false interpretation? You never achieve the desired goal. And what's the ultimate desired goal of all science, of all knowledge? To attain liberation from the cycle of birth and death. So it's a fool's paradise. It's fool's gold. It's a phantasmagoria. It's a hava mahal, as they say in Hindi. It's a palace in the sky. Yeah, a palace exists, sky exists. Have you ever seen a palace in the sky? No, it doesn't exist. Okay, you might say, oh, wait a minute. So they're talking about a, a, a satellite. <laughs> a satellite is not a palace. You want to live in a satellite, it's very uh, uncomfortable, believe me. <coughs> okay, so you have your homework for tomorrow. And are there any questions? Anything coming through? Is there anyone there? Okay. Huh? Okay. Okay, no questions, no answers. Hari Bo. Thank you very much. See you again tomorrow. Okay. Okay, how do we relate the earth and fire analogy to human beings? Yes. Okay. So, let's, uh, as I explained previously, earlier, the earth is made up of earth, water, fire, air, and ether. It's not just earth. All the five elements are present in the earth. Therefore, the earth has a potential. Now, that potential of creating trees, plants, buildings, airplanes, uh, uh, you know, concrete, whatever, uh, can only be realized if there is a soul present. The earth, the water, the fire, air, ether does, do not combine by themselves to make things. Uh, an example would be, let's say you want to build a house. Now you have, you've purchased the property where you want to build the house. Then you go to Home Depot and you buy the wood, the concrete, the nuts, the bolts, the electrical wires, everything. The shingles for the roof, everything. You buy everything that goes into building a house and you have it all delivered and put on your property. And now you wait for the earth to build it. Will it be built? What's the answer? No, it will not be built. In fact, uh, because you're not sleeping there, eventually all of it will either deteriorate or be stolen. And people will think what you're, how crazy you are to put all that stuff in an open place and leave it unprotected. So, therefore, uh, the, the building materials do not build themselves into a house. You have to have qualified carpenters, electricians, plumbers, an architect, permits, this thing, that thing, to have that house built. So things don't just happen by themselves. They happen because of living entities who are souls, who are capable of intellectual thought and, and work. A human being has 24 material, let's say, elements. Earth, water, fire, air, ether. And then uh, five, uh, those are five, the Mahabhutas, the five great uh, elements, and then you have the senses, 
eyes, ears, nose, tongue, skin. And then you have the objects of the senses, hearing, seeing, tasting, touching, smelling. So now, what is that? Five, five, five. It's uh, 15 elements. And then you have the five working senses, which are the arms, the legs, the mouth, the reproductive organs, and the uh, uh, eliminating organs. Okay. Uh, okay, so now we're at 20. And then you have the mind, intelligence, and the false ego. Now we're at 24 elements of a human being. And 25, we have the congregate of all those things. And then uh, 24, and then 25, you have the soul. And 26, you have the super soul, Paramatma. Now you have an understanding of a human being. Now with those 26 elements, the last two are the individual soul, which is not material, and the super soul, Paramatma, which is not material, or the presence of Krishna as the overseer, then things happen. Then matter can be organized into Microsoft or uh, Amazon or uh, uh, you know, Google or Twitter or Facebook or the United States or uh, the state of uh, Washington or uh, a building or a subway. Or, you know, all these things happen because of the living entity organizing m the 24 different elements, but, but the basic elements are earth, water, fire, air, and ether, or space, okay? So earth is made of uh, not only earth, but earth, water, fire, air, and ether, or space, and therefore when there's a person, they can organize, like a tree is a person, so it organizes the earth, water, fire, air, and ether into uh, a root, a trunk, branches, leaves, fruit, flowers, and fruits. And the leaves capture the energy of the sun through photosynthesis and energizes uh, all, those, uh, all the activity of pulling up in a selective way uh, minerals in the earth, and water and energy through photosynthesis and creating uh, glucose and other uh, substances such as essential oils and making cellulose and making this and making that, right? So if, if, if there's no soul present, nothing will happen. There will not be, a, like if you, if you fry a seed and plant it, it won't grow because you killed the living entity within the seed or you, you, you snuffed out its, its living principle. But if you plant a seed, a viable seed that hasn't been fried or in any way damaged, then you'll, you'll grow a, a living entity like a plant or a tree. A small banyan tree seed will grow into a gigantic banyan tree because there's a living principle in it called the soul. Okay, and when the soul leaves the body, then the body deteriorates and, and disappears and goes back to earth, water, fire, air, and ether. So without the soul, nothing happens. And there are two souls in the universe. There's the, uni there's the super soul or Krishna present in the heart of every living entity and every atom. That's why things work in a systematic way. And then there's the individual soul that has desires and uh, different aspirations. And so one soul wants to uh, be a thief. So now you have thieves. And another soul wants to be an honest person. Now you have honest people. You see, and they organize the material nature in different ways. But the ultimate super soul, Krishna, is the one who's giving knowledge, remembrance, and forgetfulness. So when Hitler developed forgetfulness, he very stupidly invaded Russia <laughs> while he had still not conquered England. So, and uh, when uh, uh, 
when uh, when uh, Winston Churchill he spoke to Truman he said you have to there's no question you have to throw the atomic bomb on Japan I'm insisting this as your ally I'm insisting now why did he say that because he was afraid that the Japanese who were supplying the Indian Independence Army which was in Burma under the control un, under the guidance of uh, general their general was uh, Subhash Chandra Bose was getting ready to invade in India and, 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 and it would have been cat catastrophic for the British so because of that and other reasons Q Truman decided to throw the atomic bomb and kill hundreds and thousands of people in Japan uh, through two of them. So, uh, you see, there are people behind everything. There's no such thing as things happen automatically or they happen by hazard. Not, no, no way is, does such a thing exist. Everything happens because there are living entities behind it. Ultimately, in the city of Sammamish, to manage this city, there's about there's a few hundred uh, workers, you know, mayors and councilmen and police and, and the uh, health department and this department and the code department and so forth to run this little city of 60,000 people. So how many people do you think it takes to run the universe with all the different planets and living entities on every planet? Well, at least 33 million devatas, at least, I would say. Do you think it's all happening like... Uh, how come the sun, they can predict exactly when the sun rises and when it sets and when the moon rises? How come they do that? Is it, is it all happening by accident? That's a bunch of nonsense. It's not happening by accident. It's because there are, there are uh, managers in the universe. The, the, the CEO is Brahma and his uh, VPs are uh, Indra and Chandra and Varuna and so forth. Don't think that there, and, and on the earth, the manager is Bhumi Devi. So don't think that all these things are happening in such synchronated, perfectly uh, regulated uh, ways by accident. Nothing happens by accident. You don't pull money out of the bank with your credit card by accident. It's because you put money in the bank that the money comes out. It's not that every time you put your credit card, you're going to get money. Unless you have put money in, you're not going to get any money. You see? So this whole idea of it's all happened by accident uh, and by permutations and combination, combinations over a long period of time, nature organized itself. This is a nonsense, foolish, infantile uh, explanation and it has no validity at all. Nothing that we see in this world has happened by accident. Microsoft didn't happen by accident. Amazon didn't happen by accident. The United States didn't happen by accident. A Ford company didn't happen by accident. How come you say that everything in the universe happened by accident? It's nonsense. It's, it's, it doesn't have any rationality to it when everything else in your life happens not by accident but by intelligent people behind it. That's why the most intelligent people, scientists, philosophers, are actually idiots. They're phonies. They're full of lies and misrepresentations. <clears throat> That's why if you read a book of the history of philosophy, it's confusing. Everybody has a different opinion. And they're all arguing with each other, writing these big books. And when you study philosophy, you get more confused after getting the PhD than before when you didn't have the PhD. Because when someone asks you a question, you say, well, maybe it's this, you know, Schopenhauer says this, and uh, uh, this other one says that, and Kant says this, and Sartre says that. And, you know, well, in, in the end, you're more confused than in the beginning. See? So the, we're in the world of mass disinformation and speculation today. And speculation is the norm, not knowledge. Okay, any other questions? Okay, that was a long answer I gave to that question. 
did they, did they, are they satisfied with the answer? Maybe they got confused because I went all over the place. Okay. So that's the end. All glories to Prabhupada. We'll continue tomorrow morning. Hare Krishna.